Hello and welcome to Diminishing Returns. This week, we're tackling The Incredibles, which was released in 2004 and was the sixth feature film from Pixar and the latest in what was a string of critical and box office successes. Fourteen years later, and a sequel is finally on its way. Whether or not it will have anything new or interesting to say remains to be seen, but no doubt it will be a lot more family-friendly than anything we come up with. Enjoy! What an incredible episode of Diminishing Returns. This is going to be, guys, <laughs> hey? The guys, of course, yeah. being incredible Alan, super Alan. <laughs> uh, hello. Good, good one. And <laughs> Fro Calvin. It's, it's Invisalign, boy. <laughs> 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 yeah. I can make your teeth straight again. Uh, and I'm I'm Sol. I'm like the baby, and you think, oh, what's he doing here? And then at the end, like all the best stuff is me. <laughs> Look yeah. out! It's it's Senor Siete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His power is to not distinguish between the quality of films. <laughs> so why are we looking at the Incredibles then? Uh. <laughs> it, it, is it because there's a long-awaited sequel, The Incredibles 2, coming out soon? Yes, Brad Bird finally came back. They mm. courted him. I think I think uh, Tomorrowland bombed, uh, and that's why. Much in the same way that uh, John Carter seemed to convince uh, Andrew Stanton to come back and do that long-awaited Finding Nemo sequel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... Come back to the well, the well of success, <laughs> and drink what comes from the well. <laughs> and go forth and make more Mission Impossible films. Brad Bird, of course, um, directed The Incredibles. It's, of course, a Pixar film. Brad Bird's an interesting one, because he's, he's one of very few um, directors who's kind of made quite a successful leap from animation to live action. Um, although he did make that big bomb in Tomorrowland. But you know what? Tomorrowland was um, very well crafted from a direction point of view. Although mm -hmm. it was awful and badly written and <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't make any sense. But like, mm -hmm. the... but his direction was pretty good for the most part. Hmm. I mean, other than steering the script into the position that it was in when they started filming, but... Yeah. He did probably the best <laughs> Mission Impossible film. Yeah, uh, we'll be, we'll I'll be save looking at thoughts that on that soon. for a future episode, because yeah, we've got quite a lot to say days. about his direction there as well. But, uh, but yeah, like he, he's an interesting director, and obviously he started out um, in animation. Uh, the Incredibles mm. was his... Oh no, Ratatouille was his last animated film before he kind of started trying to be a quote-unquote real director, which is a <laughs> phrase phrasing that you would find very frustrating, I'm sure. Because um, <laughs> he gets fair. very angry when people talk about the, the genre of animation, because it is, of course, a medium. He's right, mm. uh, but yeah. he does, but he that's, does spend that's why about directing 20 minutes. in that is completely different to directing re real life. Stuff. Well, he says it isn't, Alan. He says it isn't. Well, clearly it is. He says it's exactly the same. And he spends about 20 minutes on the commentary for The Incredibles getting very angry about people who, who refer to the <laughs> genre of animation. Oh. <laughs> he really dwells on it for a while. Um, I, I, I think in a lot of ways, to be honest, um, The Incredibles, for me, really feels like a turning point when Pixar kind of came into its own. And you have to ignore mm. the fact that they launched with Toy Story, which is arguably their best film to date in order to have that uh, <laughs> opinion. But I, I mm. feel as if they, they made Toy Story and then everything that followed for a while was a lot more kiddie and Disney-ish. And that's mm. not to say that the likes of Finding Nemo is bad or anything. And Monsters, Inc. is great. But it really feels like The Incredibles, for me certainly, was when they kind of cemented themselves as a, a real real powerhouse of uh, not just animation, but like 
making really great films consistently, um, mm. as opposed to you know being just kind of like DreamWorks Animation or <laughs> um, one mm. of the other companies mm. like that. One of the other uh, distinguishing features about this particular film is that it was the first one to feature like well star like human uh, mm. CG. Mm creations uh, yeah obviously we'd seen them in toy story and whatnot but this is the first one where it's sort of like you are not just looking at a fish or a monster or yeah some kind of creature and i think that's to mixed results i, I think like yeah coming back to this i just watched it last night mm. um and oh you can yeah, tell the, that was... <laughs> the animation is i watched ratatouille recently and i think ratatouille holds up really well like most of ratatouille i'm like wow god this could have been mm. done like yesterday this it, it's definitely of its yeah. time yeah like I, you do you mean specifically in terms of animation quality and what it looks like yeah because yeah, yeah. I, I had the same exact thought because i mm. i remembered it being a really quite you know amazing looking film uh, when it came out and being you know mm. gorgeous pixar animation but going back to it the other night it's like playstation 2 graphics rather than playstation 1 graphics actually maybe that's a bit yeah. harsh it's, it's between playstation 2 and playstation 3 graphics <laughs> that's where it is mm. um, yeah. Yeah. it's just something about like the way characters mouths move and mm. the occasional movement will feel either weightless or yeah. puppety and i don't yeah. know if it, that just is part and parcel of having what human protagonists um mm. and obviously they're incredibly stylized designs but there is still a certain mm. maybe just subconscious expectation about how yeah, things should it, move <laughs> but for when it came out it was a uh, uh quite visually astounding film i, I don't want to sound too mm. negative there cuz you know for for what they were working with in 2004 it really did push the uh mm. boundaries of what animation uh was capable of uh, on a similar note then just in terms of how this film's kind of a bit dated now the superhero genre has obviously mm. completely yeah. uh, changed and it's it's kind of weird to go back to this film because it, it, it's part of in the early noughties the very beginning of the superhero boom there was this real sense of uh, deconstructing the superhero genre and making these kind of very meta films that, well, yeah, kind of seek to, like I say, deconstruct the genre and pick it apart. And I remember a quote from, um, I think, Joss Whedon when he was writing The Avengers, and he basically said, like, I think it's the wrong attitude because we haven't even constructed the superhero genre in cinema yet. So it's, you know, we shouldn't be making these deconstructions but obviously earlier on we had films such as unbreakable which we've spoken about watchmen which this film draws heavily upon the uh the graphic novel of as well kick-ass super all, all these films that were very consciously we can't make a, a completely sincere superhero film because oh it's too silly and, and the incredibles is completely and utterly part of that movement if you ask me like i say it draws incredibly heavily upon uh, the Watchmen graphic novel. I mean, this fil the film feels all very sincere uh, in its mm. sense of it's a superhero film, but it does take jabs at that. Like, the obvious mm. example would be uh, talking about the capes and how capes are not really a practical oh, yeah. for superheroes. But, but I mean, I, I'm, like getting, I'm getting more at how it's not just a straightforward superhero thing. It's um, th th You have to go through about three layers at the start with superheroes being kind of old hat and then they fell out of fashion and no one likes them anymore and this family had to move on and I don't know it feels very self-aware like it's like I say deconstructing the genre to a point and and I don't know if it's deconstructing the genre so much as just sort of uh, being apologetic for itself <laughs> in the sense that like look we know this is silly and camp we can't quite take it seriously but we want to so we're just going to kind of mm. give a, a nod and a wink to the fact mm. that it's it's quite old fashioned, but it was still you know the the reason these deconstructions were happening was because of the X Men and because of Spider Man was suddenly made the superheroes a thing again. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I'd say the there was even films like you know Christopher Nolan's Batman uh, trilogy were kind of deconstructing the genre to a point. You know, they it, it wasn't just a flat out. Uh, comic book movie, it had to be like, well, 
what if we did that but made it quote unquote real? I just think it took a while for people to click on that comic book reality does not translate to film reality. And people were trying to do adaptations of these comic books and they weren't quite working. And they kind well, of finally figured out that, okay, we need to kind of get into a slightly different mentality, take the source material and switch it into what works within film, which has to be more realistic. Film is just by its nature more realistic than mm. animation or than comic books or than even, even the novels. In 2004, though, there weren't masses of... Um straightforward superhero films that were completely sincere like that. We obviously had the the Superman movies and the Batman movies. Um Yeah, but we, we said we said when 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 we watched the Batman films from the nineties, we said how how badly they'd aged because mm. they are comic book films. It's like let's try and get a comic book sen- um sensibility, put it into film with the sort of imagery and, and pictures and, and crazy characters that comes with that. Whereas mm. your modern, like, post-millennium mm. uh, superheroes are much, much more grounded in reality. What I'm getting at, I suppose, is that there was a time when doing a parody of a superhero film meant that, you know, you'd punch some people and have the word BAM appear on screen mm. and maybe have a little logo spin up on the screen going na 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 to, like, change the, <laughs> the scene and it's that doesn't pass anymore it's a lot more mm. elaborate than that and, and this film hails from an era when it was that punch the screen and things go bam well i mean um, even i mean you, uh, the obvious comparison is um batman what you just referred to with kapow and all that kind of stuff yeah. and from the 1960s and even adam west batman was a parody of superhero serials that were in the 1930s of course so mm. i mean even that's parody so uh, what are you saying, Sol? Are you saying The Incredibles was ahead of its time or are you saying it was out of order for slagging off the genre before it even started? I'm not saying either of those things. I'm just saying <laughs> it, it's from a different time. It's just interesting to look back at how different the the landscape is with regards to superhero films, like mm. 10 years on. Well, like I say, it's a different era and it, it's going to be interesting to see if that is reflected at all uh, in the sequel that they are working on. And I, I did find it interesting on that point that you know, a big part of this film is like a secret identity and they have to hide and all this. And that is something that, and this is pretty much down to Marvel, I think, we kind of got rid of. I know it's still there, but, you know, when as soon as Tony Stark said, yeah, I'm Iron Man, that kind oh, of yeah, put to yeah. bed the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Very consciously they did that, yeah. A lot of their characters in the comics, Thor traditionally has a mm. secret identity and lots of the characters do. And they, they just kind of thought... Fuck it. We we for whatever reason they don't care anymore. Even the new Spider-Man Homecoming like ends with Aunt May learning about P- Peter Parker being Spider-Man, so he doesn't have to worry about it. It's that's it's interesting because it is such a big part of comic book law, as far as I know, as a, a layman. And so, why yeah. was that? I mean, you're a bit more of a comic book guy. Why was well, that such a big thing back in the day, where it was important to be able to be a normal person and have a secret identity rather than just being a super great person? I think part of it is that it just becomes so cliche and trite as well. It was a joke, you know, the fact, the idea that Clark Kent can put on some, uh, sorry, that Superman can put on some glasses and then hide as a uh, completely different guy in plain sight is ludicrous. And I just think Marvel were aware that what, like you say, what would pass in the comic books would be a lot more difficult to pull off in the films as every Superman film has proved. Yeah, and um, not only, you know, would it run into the grounds of being a bit silly, but it, it just gets a bit messy. This It's this extra complication with writing that you you don't always um, want, because we, we've seen enough films where a, a hero has to juggle a secret identity and... It, 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 it almost strikes me like, and I'm, I'm sure the people involved know their stuff with comic books and so on, but it, it, it strikes me like a film that was largely um, written by people who weren't necessarily avid comic book readers themselves, uh, who were kind of people who'd consumed the odd bit of superhero stuff passively and then wrote their own great take on it. 
I made a similar note, actually, uh, to that point, because uh, to me, like, watching The Incredibles, I see as much influence from, like, 1960s spy genre mm. films as I do, yeah. like, comic books. Absolutely. Like, a lot of yeah. the sets, a uh, very Ken Adam, James Bond production designer uh, inspired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what would be great mm. would be if Pixar made the next James Bond movie? They'd actually yeah. be a good Bond film, because that, that opening sequence <laughs> in Cars 2 was really good as well. Oh, I, I I like Cars 2 purely because of all the James Bondy <laughs> elements. Well, uh, the, the spy stuff works quite nicely in Cars 2. Yeah. The, the film it's doesn't they, as a whole, but that, yeah. yeah. It's whenever they have to get a character <laughs> story in the uh, Ka- that Calvin, horrible dump truck. <laughs> Calvin, can you, uh, can you do John Ratzenberger saying the name's Bond, James Bond? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, hello, Miss Moneypenny. Yeah. What uh, what you get there? That uh, that a rose on your desk? Yeah, from uh, Rosa with love, eh? Uh. <laughs> like his hair I loved room. his character at the end of the film, getting a bit ahead of ourselves here, but he pops John Ratzenberger, oh, yeah, obviously, yeah. has a role in every Pixar film, and he pops up at the end of The Incredibles as the underminer. I believe reprising villain. that role in the new one as well. Amazing! Um, <laughs> My understanding is the new film basically picks up exactly at the end of the first film. Uh, oh, really? Well, actually, yeah, all the kids are the same age, aren't they, in the trailer? Yeah, yeah, they had to recast the little boy, because his voice broke, presumably. Um, <laughs> I, is this a good segue to talk about the voices? Because I have a lot of yeah. opinions yeah. about Yeah, I'd like these Yeah, voices. yeah, yeah. I, uh, my opinion on the cast as a whole is that they are excellent um, Picks are doing a great job casting interesting, uh, like good actors with you know enough interesting qualities about their voices to do a great job. Mm, there are okay. one or two uh, voices that kind of stick out to me as sore thumbs that don't quite fit mm. the character design, don't quite just aren't quite right in the film. Mm. Um, but for the most Likewise. part, I think it's to a very high standard the voice acting. Okay, well, can I can I throw in like first of all, I think that. Your main couple, Craig T. Nelson and Holly Hunter, are kind of deliberately normal voices, if you know what I mean. They're not big character oh, voices. I was, no, They're I kind of that. I, I think Holly Hunter's got an incredibly distinctive voice for a woman. and I, I don't she... mean... Uh, indistinctive is not particularly the right word, but they're supposed to be, hey, okay, we're superheroes, but we're just a normal couple. They're supposed to sound like normal. Yeah, so, yeah, as opposed yeah. to, say, like a Wallace Shawn, for example. Okay, so... Yeah, of course. And yeah. I think Holly They're Hunter's They're not cartoony great voice. voices. So. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I think Holly Hunter's perfect for that because she has still got a great mm. voice despite mm. that. I think Craig T. Nelson's voice, a little bit bland and boring. Yeah. And I also think his performance is a little bit bland and boring as well. Mm. I think mm. that is kind of deliberate, but I yeah. also think it loses something in that. I think I think he's fine, but I agree he's not particularly yeah, he's fine. remarkable. I think Lack Holly, the Holly Hunter I is... Uh, I think she's great in this yeah, film. I think she brings oh, a lot to it. Yeah. And... Uh, mm. She's one of the vocal highlights for me. Yeah, um, yeah totally. the other the other highlight for me, and I I wouldn't be surprised if Calvin has the exact opposite opinion. <laughs> but the other vocal highlight for me is Jason Lee as uh, mm-hmm. Syndrome, who I think is brilliant. Uh, it's the best use of Jason Lee in anything <laughs> that I've ever seen. <laughs> I think uh, he's fine. Yeah, I, I, I don't mind him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one that really annoys me is the daughter, um, Sarah Vowell, I think, is the actress, and I don't know, it's not a familiar name to me, but all the way through, I could just tell, like, the boy's voice is great, because you can tell they just got a good, like, yeah. 10-year-old to do it, but I think um, Sarah Vowell was, like, 35 or something when she did it, and all you right. can tell, you can tell that it's a... Uh, a woman trying to do a awkward teenager voice, and it sounds mm. too cartoony and out of the reality of the rest of the family to me. Um, annoyingly, I've I've made notes of my favourite voices. I haven't made notes of the ones that stood out to me as annoying and I didn't like, mm. but there definitely were some that grated on me, and I'm trying to remember who they are, but I can't. Brad Bird. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I like Brad Bird. I thought I, it was a, yeah, that was a I'm... great character voice. Mm. I mean, it was very much a it was a cartoon character, but it it worked mm. for what it was. I really thought that was good. I don't mind Brad Bird in this so much, but I do. It does annoy me a bit because it feel every time Edna Mode appears, it feels so self congratulatory, so smug. Like they think 
isn't this hilarious, this character we've got? And do, oh, do you know what? It's mm. the director doing the voice. And mm. it's it's like this that slug in Monsters Inc. is the exact uh, yeah, same I, thing the for exact, me. I wrote that down that exact thing. Roz from Monsters Inc. Yeah, because yeah. she was voiced by someone who was just in the office, wasn't she? Who Yeah. They just yeah. got in as like a temp voice and then they couldn't they were like, Oh, no one's gonna do it better than that or whatever. And I think it was yeah. very similar. Brad Bird did the animatic voice for Edna and then they couldn't find anyone that seemed right when they were trying to cast it. Mm. Um and I don't mind Edna, but I just something about that character just feels not even half baked. It just feels like maybe eighty five percent baked, and there's just <laughs> something missing from it. And I think mm. that that something would be there had they, you know, cast a, a Zelda Rubenstein or someone in the role. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, Sam Jackson's great. As oh, his, I forgot um, he was in this. Yeah, of course. Yep, He's yep, always yep. a joy, uh, always a pleasure. Standard, standard He's only got Jackson about notes. three lines in the film. I made a note, by the way. Uh, this is another thing that's really dated in this film, uh, and it's the, the least realistic part of the film. You know, early on when uh, when Mr. Fantastic when the policeman doesn't throws... immediately shoot him. Yeah, is that what yeah, exactly. <laughs> when when he's like <laughs> when when the well. policeman yeah. goes freeze, pulls a gun on him, and he reaches his arms, and the guy's like freeze, and he goes, "I'm just getting a glass of water," and it's like, no, he'd be dead on the floor. You know, like <laughs> ten bullets in well, him. The, the interesting thing I have about it is that yeah. that one that one cop runs in, he's got a gun to him. The other cops are just waiting outside, <laughs> just in case anything happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, can I make another broad point before we get into kind of plot things? Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, the superpowers involved are, of course, relevant to the characters. Yeah. In that classic comic book way. So you got your Mister Incredible, who's the big, strong, like alpha male, I'll look after my family kind of man. Uh, the Elastic Girl, she has to pull herself every which way because she's looking after kids and she's running the house and she's doing this. Uh, you got the just pure energy little boy who can't stop moving around, and then the teenage girl who just wants to disappear. Mm. Good, fantastic, good writing. And then, obviously, they decided that being able to disappear is not going to be much use for this plot. So, yes, the little girl can create force fields of energy or something for no no reasoning behind that, and just because we maybe we'll well, use it in the plot later. I think it makes thematic sense because as a teenager, putting up barriers, yeah. that kind of thing. In terms of, it feels like she's got two powers, everyone else has one. Mm. And it, it's, it feels it's, like she has that power for plot convenience more than yeah. It's a Fantastic else. Four thing. They, they've all, they, they are just a rip-off of the Fantastic Four. And in the Fantastic Four, you've got Mr. Fantastic, who's stretchy, that's Elastigirl. You've got the thing who's just a big rock monster, but very strong. That's basically Mr. Incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got Human Torch, who goes on fire and is quick. And the, the closest analogy would be the boy, but also arguably the baby. But then you've also got Sue Storm, the invisible woman, who is the daughter. And her powers are she can go invisible and make force fields. Um, and oh. I think mm-hmm. I think they yeah. have just taken the powers from the Fantastic Four, and there was an element of, oh, the audience will go with this, because that's uh, they know that invisibility goes with force fields. Um, <laughs> I think there was kind of a, a thought process of that going with it, but it, yeah, it is a bit odd, <laughs> basically. Not- it bothered me the most when it, she um, they're in these like uh, restraint um, energy things that are like holding them uh, in place mm. when they're caught by the villain later on in the film and she just uses her force field thing and zoom, she gets out and okay, I guess that's what has to happen to get them out, but yeah. Um, on, on a similar note to that actually I, I just want to mention one of the reasons I think this film works so well is that it is constantly constantly throwing really innovative, like, interesting little concepts at you. And I I don't mean, like, thematically. I just mean, like, gadgets and things. Just uh, when Mr. Incredible tries to sneak into that that room and then gets caught, and he's caught because he's got all these weird expanding, like, balls of goo fired at him that just keep expanding out. It's... it's, You never see those things before or again later, but there is such a cool design of a, a gadget that 
just kind of comes and goes. Uh, th- those kind of helicopter things that these people are flying, these hovercraft things that are just like spinning blades of death. Again, quite a unique, um, interesting vehicle that they're they're using. That you, you know, that it, there's so much stuff like that constantly thrown at you in this film. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. I agree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a shame they didn't put any of that creativity into the script. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, Alan. <laughs> right. Uh, well, should we get into the story then? Before we get into the plot, and I think this, I think this kind of goes back to what I was saying about this feeling like a turning point for Pixar to me. Is I think this is a really quite remarkably mature film for a kids' film. I think there are a lot of themes in this film that are very adult. Uh, not to mention, you know, little hints at sex and things like that but I, I i just mean you know that the idea that um mr incredible is so kind of unfulfilled in his life um or that the film's willing to be as kind of cynical and 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 dark in places as it is that the idea that everyone being special in their own way is the same thing as saying no one's special um mm. i just think there's an awful lot of maturity about this film that it wasn't present in the likes of Finding Nemo, um, mm. Mm. Uh, and there's a darkness and... as well. When um, when Mr. Incredible thinks his family's been killed, yeah, mm. he manages to get hold of the the, the and he's going to yeah. kill this woman basically because he's like mm. he's lost everything and he's just doesn't yeah. care anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole plot element as well, and this is going back to the more superficial side of it as well. But um, you know, there's a a plot point that uh, Elastigirl thinks her husband's cheating on her, basically. It becomes this mm. whole driving force that motivates the character for a bit. And and there, there's a lot of, you know, there's references to peeping Toms in the newspaper earlier on, uh, one of the superhero scandals, because he's got x-ray vision. Um, there's that montage oh. where Elastigirl keeps pulling Mr. Incredible back into the house to, like, go again because she's like into him because he's lost a that bit is and... that's a very kind of 1970s sitcom kind of no i know though. it's not it's... like that's not exactly filth is it no it's not at all it's just you know it's it's clearly a film being made for an adult audience that's kind of what well, i'm getting that was at, it. i was interested that... well you you said it was mature for a kid's film i don't think i would call it a kid's film it's a family friendly film. It's a child friendly film, but it's not a kids film. That's yeah, that's it. It's it's basically I think this was the first time Pixar had truly made just a film for like adults that was just something that kids could watch and enjoy as well. Um characters dying. I mean, there's a montage of people being killed by yes. the capes getting caught on things. There there's Kronos's bones found in the cave and the villain is straight up murdered all these other characters, but you know you see the character's skeleton of this character that he murdered, and and I don't know if the Incredibles themselves actually facilitate a death of anyone deliberately, but their actions will set in um, I, yeah. set off a chain of events that lets henchmen be killed. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Um, so the other big part of the uh, story is that uh, the Jason Lee character, what's his name, Syndrome, um, he's in the buddy. sort of... Yeah, buddy. He's in sort of the prelude and the main body of the film. He's the main villain um, because he wanted to be Mr. Incredible's ward. He basically wanted to be Robin to Mr. Incredible's Batman. And Mr. Incredible was like, no, go away, kid. You've not got any powers. And uh, what, what is it he says? There's a particular phrase that he uses... Um, yeah, it's it's not that he doesn't want him there because he hasn't got any powers. It's that he doesn't want responsibility for getting this kid yeah, like yeah, harmed, basically. And then mm. you know, not to mention that he fucks up the um, his actions allow the villain to get away, don't they? In that yeah, sequence, in, in, in the yeah. prelude, yeah. So then he turns to villainry. Um, he's not getting any superpowers, but he's very rich and has a lot of mm. gadgets and and, and stuff. But it's it's very much a kind of um, his his grand you know evil plan is basically kill all the superheroes so that he can then create a false uh, mm. false flag attack that he then rushes in to save so that he's the only hero and everyone thinks he's brilliant. So he is basically manufacturing his fantasy of being a superhero that he always wanted. He's just doing it in a weird mm. way that involves mm. killing lots of people. Um, mm. Loved that. Loved his plan. 
my my kind of major issue with the the plot was, and not that this is terribly bad, but it was all just a little bit basic. It was all very straightforward, like in mm-hmm. terms of the emotional developments and the relationships and stuff like that. It was all a bit like, okay, and now this and blah blah blah. Yeah, it's like okay, you know everything that's going to happen. Right from the start, pretty much. Um, and so it felt just a bit too easy and hmm. kind of simple. This film, I, I think it's fairly simple, but it's it's done... It's it's like when we talked about Back to the Future. It's it's a remarkably well-written screenplay, if you ask me, for the most part. It's, it's one of those scripts where it's just almost effortless in places. The, the way things kind of click into place. This is set up here. This pays off here. I think there's enough um, emotional depth to what they're doing and and subtext and yeah, I think I I, I mean I certainly enjoy this film more than oh God probably every film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and I, I would say it's less predictable mm. and more inventive and exciting than a good deal of those films. Yeah, I mean I I probably put it above mm, I don't know, it's just... almost all of the Marvel films and I'm I'm the big Marvel fanboy on this show. Is, you know. Mm, mm. It's just that every character journey is right there at the beginning, and you can see it like it's etched well, in stone. It's, um, there's no I, surprise. I don't know. I, I think there were some bits that I was like, like I really like the bit where um, Elastigirl and the two kids are on the uh, plane, the jet, and mm. uh, there are missiles incoming, and they're going to blow up. And the Elastigirl keeps like shouting at her door, "You've got to use your force field. You've got to use your force field. Come yeah. on, do it, do it." And like, I think in a in another kind of movie that she, like she would have made the force field and it would have all been okay, but mm. the missiles actually hit the plane because she can't do it. Yeah. Um. And then the characters have to get to the island and Mister Incredible yeah. another way. Like that surprised me. I thought that was a very exciting yeah. sequence. I think there's a lot of that in this film, and I I think one of the biggest reasons that I think this film's so great is that it it has truly remarkable action sequences i'm i'm not a mm. big action guy generally speaking but if something is choreographed and and inventive to the level and the, the degree that the sequences in this film are the, the one with dash running away from those spiky things the 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 plane sequence you just mentioned mm. um mm. Down to the the you know the stealthy bit of Elastigirl trying to sneak through the doors and she gets caught in all of those doors. Um, mm. Everything about this film is is just impeccably well crafted, and I, I think Brad Bird is a a truly phenomenal director of animation. Um, mm. And I'll I'll, mm. <laughs> I'll get more into how I feel about his live action work when we come to Mission Impossible, but. Um, mm. My last uh, more general point is, but I felt like the script needed a bit more witty banter. It needed a little bit more repartee between some characters and some snappy lines and just more interesting dialogue. Mm. It was all just a little bit too by the numbers and boring. Yeah, I, I do think there are places where you're kind of expecting a really quippy line and you just get something like, hey, that's why they call me Mr. Incredible. And it's like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> like... <laughs> That's that's not a clever line, is it? I, oh. But um, mm. yeah, I, 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 one of my notes is just it's got thrills, it's got chills, it's got kills, it's got everything. This They're film. multiplying. <laughs> it's so it's so tense. This film. Tr- oh, when it needs to be tense, it's so tense. It, it like it works. It's funny in places. Electrifying. It, yeah. You know what annoyed me though. I'm doing this Greece. rewatch, and this didn't annoy me when I watched it like last time. Hello, hello. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you can hear me. Okay. We're choosing to ignore you, Calvin. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a legitimate minor gripe, actually, which is just I, I've picked up on this in a few films recently. It, I just find it kind of weirdly messy how often films will kind of open with about three layers that you have to go through. And the fact this film opens on this weird thing of talking heads with like some mm. superheroes from the part, like archive footage, and then we we jump into like a flashback sequence in the past, and then we have a montage that like fills us in from the past to the fu- like present day. It just feels really weird. I just don't basically I don't like those talking heads at the start. I don't know what they're adding, mm. why they're there. 
Hmm. Yeah, in that case, yeah, frame it so that, oh, look, someone's watching a documentary hmm. about the history of superheroes. And I, I think perhaps uh, it's meant I mean. as a, don't worry, guys, this is a self-aware film. We know the superhero genre is silly and we're doing a kind of objective look at the genre from afar. I, I think it's almost part of a, a holdover from what I was talking about at the start, this film being made hmm. before the superhero boom had been accepted into the mainstream quite as much as it is now. And I don't like the first minute and a half or so of this film. <laughs> um, hmm. But I love everything that follows. Mm. Apart from my other, my other minor gripe, <laughs> actually. I've just remembered. <laughs> it's another structural thing. And I bet Calvin loves it, because this is something you get in James Bond films. The, the film kind of ends twice. Like, it ends, and then they're like, oh shit, we forgot to uh, get rid of the villain. Um, mm. And then they go home, and there's like an epilogue almost with them dealing with the villain and the baby, and it, it just feels messy, like this extra addendum to the film. Um, I, I did actually really like that, uh, and, and again, like I haven't I haven't seen this film in many years, and I did forget that because when they they've sort of uh, saved the day and they're driving back home in this limousine and they're getting a briefing from the government agent and the babysitter that they left the baby with is panicking on the phone and I thought oh well they're gonna get back home and the house will be burnt down or yeah um, there'll be a, a different bit, babysitter a gag at the end yeah I thought that was what it was leading then when they open the door and it's syndrome and he immediately like zaps them and then starts mm. taking off with the baby like I thought that was yeah really really good twist and it also leads to syndrome's death I think maybe what what your issue is Sol if you're gonna do the big boss villain death then do it Whereas this feels like it's kind of a throwaway scene at the end. Oh shit, we forgot to tie up the loose end. We better just throw a scene on yeah. it. Yeah. Because it does happen very... Like, he, he manages to escape and then it's like, oh no, uh, you're caught. So I mean, it's obviously that it. written that way. I don't yeah, believe and, uh, you know, he... writing the script and then like, oh, wait a minute, what do we do about this? So it's oh, much yeah, easier to it... stick this on the end instead of going back and... Oh yeah, it, it, something. it's... You know, it's death set up with the cape joke earlier on. It, it pays off. Yeah. And... I think I appreciated this film a lot more now coming back and seeing it again. I think this is probably only the second or third time I've actually seen it, which is something when it comes to Pixar films, but I certainly didn't see it when it first came out because I was 14 then, and while Saul might have been confident enough to strut his stuff into a cinema <laughs> to see an animated Pixar film, I was uh, not... I was far more discerning about where I was seen in public in those days. Had you, were, you, were you out of the closet back then? What does that have to do with seeing The Incredibles? <laughs> Because I'm because because you weren't confident enough to like watch an animated film. I'm wondering how kind of confident you were in your like self as a person. There's, there's literally no correlation between them. No, there's a massive correlation. I'm I'm trying to figure out how comfortable you were in your own skin at that point in your life. That's so. Well, you met about. Calvin when he was 18, and you know he wasn't comfortable in his skin then. So why do you think <laughs> it would have been when he was 40? <laughs> Well, what I I I'm, I want to. Why? What's the problem with going in to see this film when you're 14? Oh God, because it's no, like it, a kids' film. Well, yeah. And you look like a kid. Yeah, because you're 14 and you're at high school. You're trying to fit in and not look like a little kid anymore. And oh, okay, all those kinds of things. Didn't you? Couldn't you have gone with one of your girlfriends? <laughs> and then you were like, oh, she wanted to see it. <laughs> mm. I. <laughs> It's it's worse when it was worse than you you and I went to watch Winnie the Pooh and like <laughs> and we were both like twenty and I was like you know what I'd I'd really better shave before we go because it'll look worse if I'm there with like a bit of stubble I'll just look like too much of a, a child grooming creep and oh, well, this is the, this is why because I I often go to the cinema on my own and I can't go to see kids films on my own like I at least have to go with another adult because. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just like a creepy guy on my own in a kid's film, like watching fucking Minions. <laughs> the worst <laughs> I ever had is when I, w I went to see Brave at the cinema, and I just went on like, I think I had a day off work or something, and I was just like, oh, I just went on like, you know, a Tuesday morning when no one's going to be there, it'll be fine. It'll probably just be me sat there. Anyway, um, I guess these two kids must have been off school, and their like, mum had dropped them off at the cinema or something, because it was literally <laughs> just, they were ahead of me buying the ticket, and then they ran off all very excited, and then I walk into the cinema, and they're like, I can hear them as I'm coming down you know the bit and then you turn and you see all the seats and uh, <laughs> they're laughing and playing and then literally as soon as they see me silence for the next two hours um good anyway yeah. i um i sat down but the way this cinema in hammersmith in fact Saul, we saw uh les miserables there i believe oh that one um, yes yeah, yeah you know how there was like you, like you walk up 
some steps and then there's like a little platform and you can either go up onto the seats or go down onto the seats and there's like two sections of seats and they're divided by a little wall i remember i i I watched wreck it ralph in there in that uh, what i assume was that screen and halfway through the film like (laughs) it was like benny hill some some kid came running in to the screen (laughs) we heard this like i was like what the fuck some kid came running in like ran across to the other like entrance way and out again and then like <laughs> then like two policemen came afterwards <laughs> <laughs> looked all around the screen ran to the other side and then like three members of staff and honestly it was just like the weirdest like <laughs> interruption and then oh the, then everyone just carried on watching the film <laughs> well, I, I, I went down, because they were sat in the upper bit, so I went and sat down in the lower bit, but I sat on the very end, because I was like, well, I'm here by myself, I want to make a quick exit, and, you know, I don't want to be stuck in the middle if... Anyway, no one else kept turned up, so it was just the three of us, but um, I thought, I, I want a better view from the middle seat, but I don't want them to, like, see me stand up and go to the middle, because <laughs> for some reason I thought that would be odd, so I, like, got down on the floor, like, so they wouldn't <laughs> see me. Um, and just like scurried along until the middle bit and then slowly raised myself up. And when you, when you raised yourself up, were they both just staring at you? Like, mouth, mouths a jar. <laughs> I couldn't turn around and look, I was too scared. Uh, anyway, they left, they left the screen before me. I don't even know if they sat through the whole film. They weren't there when I, when the credits were there. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I don't want to look weird. I better just get on the phone. And call it's like if, I, if I'm going to be weird, I better commit to it fully. Uh, anyway, that's yeah. So, so that's why I, I don't. I, you know, that's yeah. why um, I didn't want to go and see The Incredibles when I was 14. Fuck me. Uh, anyway, um, Incredibles. Yeah. We were doing ratings. Uh, anyway, um, eight out of ten. Ooh, I I, I think I've kind of made my position pretty clear. I, I think this is a really, just really high quality bit of work. Represents Pixar pretty much at its best. Seven. Uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> nine out of ten for me. Oof. Well, I'm going to give it a solid six. Yeah. Mm. That's fair, Alan, for you. <laughs> <laughs> my score was... My score's Closer to yours, Calvin. Is mine not fair? No, that's fair for Alan. Oh, okay. Oh, all <laughs> right. Because yeah. he could very easily have just gone woo, four. Yeah, woo. <laughs> yeah, six is. I mean, it's a bit mean, a bit stingy, but. Uh... So you'll be very excited for the sequel, then, I assume. Um. Yes and no. In theory, they should keep making loads of these films. You could make, you know, countless Incredibles adventures. It, it's yeah. I was going to say it's, it does seem set up for a sequel, doesn't it? Like yeah. you've set this, you've created this world. Just create a new villain. It's easy. But why haven't they done it for so long? It doesn't even uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be the same characters. Just the the universe um, superhero movies made by Pixar. But the characters certainly have got more life in them. On paper, I, I can't wait for it. But I've also seen the trailer, so I, I don't know. Have you guys seen it? Yeah, yeah, it looks like they're playing with gender politics, which is very hot right now. Um, and they're going to mess around with that a little bit. Uh, stay-at-home dad, all that kind of thing. Very modern. Yeah, it it just it, it's just the most <laughs> underwhelming trailer to me. Nothing about it. Yeah, it just seemed really fucking boring. It, it, they the the trailer focuses almost entirely on the family dynamic, and I know that the film needs yeah. that and a, a strong emotional core to work. But the trailer, you want to see the new villain and the gung ho action, and it and and I get the sense that this is probably a bad trailer, and I think I'll go along and enjoy the film. I I really hope that's the case, but I don't know. I'm just kind of not very excited for it based on what I've seen. I'm I'm looking forward to it very much. Yeah, um, I, it's one. I'm sure it will be excellent, and I'll love it. But I just I don't know. I mean, I I've slagged that off enough that I'm now gonna eat my words as I fail to contribute anything of use towards what they should do in the next one. Uh, as we pitch <laughs> our own sequel idea. Have you guys got well, any ideas? All- well, no, it's always really tough when it comes to these superhero type films, and I think we've seen this when we've talked about Marvel because mm. you just slap in a new villain 
uh, I don't know. It, it feels the structure and, and of like a series, a superhero series, just feels more mathematical yeah. than um, I think some of the other films that we've covered where we have more interesting ideas for sequels. Yeah, I, I think the obvious thing to do, the obvious route to go, would be to kind of address that the first one was made at a different point mm-hmm. in the growth of the superhero genre and make a film that really kind of digs into how that genre has changed. But I don't know if I really mm. want to see that. I don't know if I really want to see an Incredibles film with al- allusions to other superhero films that don't actually exist where they pop up for cameos mm. during mm. the credit. Like, I just, I, I don't think, I think part of the joy and part of why this film works is that it is such a throwback to to pulp entertainment yeah. of the 60s and the, the 70s. And mm. like you say, it's a blend of, of superhero comic books and spy movies and, you know, stuff like Thunderbirds and shit that kind of drew upon mm. those things mm. as well. It, it, mm. What could work, though, is if you stick to that style, but you have it as some big shit is going down, and so the Incredible family have to pull together a team of superheroes. Mm. And like, and then you create that team thing yeah. that people do now. And I do think it's likely we'll get some more heroes in this new film. I, I'd be surprised if we don't see some new superheroes thrown into the mix. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that could work quite nicely if they were almost going to assemble their own kind of Avengers team. Because then, you know, they've got the full family, they've got Frozone. You only need to add one or two new characters into the mix. Yeah. And it, it's kind of an you organic... Can start, you can start setting up ideas of spin-offs then. Create some good characters. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, I'd I'd be almost concerned about it becoming a, a spoof movie. Is the other thing I, I think The Incredibles really is. Um, mm. It's not a superhero parody. It's a superhero film that's also a comedy. You know, it, it and well, I think focusing on the family aspect is correct. Yeah, I mean, when you look at how many other superhero films are out there, I don't know how hmm. exciting it is just to see a new villain or a... Yeah. Oh, well, that's what the plot is of this one, yeah. then, I guess. Well, that's yeah. it. It's meant to be a human tale told on this fantastical backdrop. That's how genre filmmaking mm. should work 99% mm. Mm. of the time as it is. And So, I mean, what the, the, the first film is kind of about um, unfulfilled potential, I suppose. That's kind of the the theme of it, isn't mm. it? Um, yeah. yeah. And it kind of plays out with a a kind of midlife crisis and just that kind of universal feeling of monotonous day-to-day life and everything. So, I mean, what what would the theme of the second one be? That's kind of what we'd need to figure out. Um, getting everything you think you wanted and then Ooh. realizing that you were wrong. Mm. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I like it. And then they do get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> and he ends up with Mirage. <laughs> ah. Yeah, like I what I liked about the boy character that Dash was that they were like by the end it was like okay you can do sports and that but you have to kind of edge yourself back and sort of hold yourself back still. Mm. Um so would that carry on the way he starts to get frustrated that he has to hold himself back all the time which he was doing mm. anyway. Um or be- he finds winning so easy that he loses interest in it. Hmm. Like I say, that sort of getting what you want and then kind of not yeah. and realising that it doesn't mean anything. Should we time jump about ten years forward and the kid's competing in the Olympics, but he's like a really messed up <laughs> character, struggling with alcoholism hmm. and stuff because he, he yeah, he, he doesn't yeah, he's get very anything arrogant. out of it. He's just there to like earn his money, basically, but he, he's not hmm. fulfilled by doing it. Um, yeah, he's like Ronnie O'Sullivan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but it's, I'm sure <laughs> no, I just I dropped that reference in knowing that neither of you would get it. That's, that was the beauty of it. <laughs> He's a snooker player, isn't he? That is correct. Right. Um, He's a fascinating character. Uh, is it right to drag your kids into the working world ooh. at such a young age? Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I would really like to see the ethics explored of having the kids on a superhero team, which appears to be the dynamic in the, the new film that they are just part and parcel of this. But then they do have special powers and what have you. I think that could or, be Or you do it like, you know, as people get old, you get weaker. And so, you know, you're Mr. Incredible. Ooh, old man. He can't, quite, incredible. he can't quite lift that car like he used to, as easy as he yeah. used to. And Elastigirl, when she stretches it, like it takes a little bit longer to bounce back. I think we should <laughs> save that for the third one. That seems like the 
conclusion yeah, to the trilogy. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. mind a time jump in one of these things. It's a I bit, would, like, a bit yeah. like Finding Dory. Yeah. I, I was slightly disappointed that it it picked up like a matter of weeks after the yeah. first film. And I know that Toy Story takes some, um, you know, pretty big leaps in time, but it mm. never really affects like well, the that's characters, it. Yeah. Woody and Buzz and whatnot. Other than the circumstance they find them in, because yeah. oh, Andy's giving them away or whatever. Yeah, I was surprised that the Incredibles two opted for just picking up. But the end of the first film, mm. um, I don't know quite why. I never really thought about it, but I suppose on some level, I just always expected it to have a little bit of a time jump. But if you jump forward, like yeah, five years, you've got that. The girl is like she wants to go to university. She doesn't want to be fighting crime. She's she's got her own thing going on, right? Because mm. she's super brainy too. And then the boy is now the teenager, and so he's going through mm. his shit. Maybe he's he's finally getting down to with it with some girls, and it turns out he's extra speedy in that area as well. I think the problem <laughs> is, um... I think you should have uh, Frozone is now the mayor. Uh, just because I think that would work. <laughs> I think it'd be good. Is that a reference he's like... to something that I'm not? No, I just whenever I see it, when I saw his character, like I was thinking of what's in his future. It was like I bet he like becomes the mayor, and he's like the kind of trendy mayor. I think, <laughs> but then he helps them because, like, he's got power. Then, mm. I mean, real power, not silly powers. <laughs> I don't know what that is that you're pitching <laughs> right now. I don't know what. <laughs> oh god! Well, you know, in the first film, all these guys with their superpowers they are trumped, and I use that word accidentally. They are trumped yeah. by politics. They are forced to go into hiding. They are all their powers are. are Nothing compared to political ah, power. I see. Yeah, yeah. Think on. Maybe that. Maybe in the next film. Maybe our film should be <laughs> that Disney turn up and and sue them for ripping off the Fantastic <laughs> Four and X Men in the case of Frozen. Um, <laughs> and it becomes a very weird, self-aware meta film where Disney essentially sues itself, but obviously the, in, in the world of the Incredibles, they're real people, so they're not owned by Disney. And it opens up a wormhole in the universe of the And film. then Iron Man comes out and Thanos and... It, oh, God. <laughs> we need the animation Infinity Stone <laughs> here somewhere. Uh, yeah, it, it, it gives life to the inanimate. It's a life stone. Ooh, yes. Perfect. Yep, Motion to the motionless, go. yeah. <laughs> and the baby has it. And Thanos has to kill the baby. But it's fine, because it'll come back in the sequel. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed this, then why not check out our back catalogue? In fact, you can travel back exactly two years to when we previously covered a Pixar film, Finding Nemo. Find that episode and many more on our website, dimreturns.com. And keep listening for a little post credit scene in which we catch up with another franchise that we've previously covered way back in episode 44. That's right, it's everyone's favourite, Tremors. Can I just in- indulge a few minutes of your time for a bit of any other business? Okay. Uh, <laughs> this afternoon, I watched Tremors 6. <laughs> oh! Uh, so would you like a quick uh, analysis? Oh, go yeah, on, Keep then. it nice and short. Do you want me to, want to keep it spoiler-free? I don't want to ruin it for oh, you. Oh, yes, yes. No, I, I do want to watch it at some point. Unless Michael Gross dies, and then you can tell me that. <laughs> well, the, it's called Tremors colon... Uh, oh, okay. fuck me, <laughs> Tremors Cola. Imagine those things swimming around in there. Oh. Tapeworms. Well, there are tapeworms in the film. <laughs> there are actually um, tapeworms in the film. Well, Bert is sick. and then What's it called? Sorry, Tremors Colon what? It's, it's called Tremors Colon, A Cold Day in Hell. <laughs> now, hmm. so fairly meaningless. <laughs> but then it begins in the, in the Canadian Arctic Circle. So it's all snow... Uh, everything's freezing cold, except everyone's just wearing cardigans and no gloves. All right. Um, hmm. But 
But the point is that they kind of accidentally awaken these graboids in the frozen tundra, right? Okay. So that's a cold day in hell. It's going to be something to do with that. So I'm thinking, okay, yeah, good. This is going to be like Tremors, but in ice or in snow or whatever. Something mm-hmm. a little bit different. They kind of then don't follow through on that at all because when mm-hmm. they get Bert Gummer up to, to investigate and deal with it, they're in this little patch where there's no snow at all. And they're like, oh, why isn't there any snow here? And it's quite warm. We're not even wearing coats. And like, oh, it's just unseasonably warm. And uh, just this particular <gasps> area, the atmosphere conditions means there's no snow here. Oh. Um, what? And so it's not like that at all. And they filmed it in South Africa. And <laughs> it basically is just, there's no snow in it. And it's not cold. And right. it's, not a, it's not different to the last film at all. And so it's just basically, oh, look, here's some more graboids. They're going to kill them. Oh, Jamie shame. Kennedy's still in it. Jamie Kennedy is very much still in it and mm. still improving. Uh, and obviously, his improv skills go to just saying random things that make no sense mm. and hope they're funny. So, yeah, it is. You look like a, a worm had sex with uh, <laughs> a dildo. <laughs> That's that's TJ Miller just popped in for a cameo. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make as much sense as that, mm. unfortunately. The, the only slight difference thing they do is Bert is sick and he keeps sort of collapsing and stuff and he's kind of too macho to accept that there's anything wrong with him. They figure out that he's got some sort of parasite infection from the graboid. So they have to trap a graboid alive in order to suck some juice out of it, which will then cure him, of course, uh, mm. in some sort of magic medicine thing. Uh, and so then that becomes a different issue because they have to try and catch one. And it's this whole thing where Gummer's not fit to do anything. And so what's his face has to stand up and kind of be the man and take charge, the son. Mm. Uh, so it's a bit nonsense. <clears throat> the, so the plot is kind of just a bit the same, same, same. Mm. Uh, what I will say is that on for a low budget, it works. There's a little bit of model work. There's also the CG stuff, and it, that's quite solid. They have ass blasters mm. as well, the, but the kind of redesigned oh. ones. Okay. The actors are all all right. Um, none of them are like, oh my god, why why are they out? Did they let these out of the soaps and into films? Kind of actors. Yeah. They're all perfectly fine. The characters are quite well rounded. There's a few of them that you couldn't tell who's who, but you know, a few of the characters are. Kind of, okay, that's got a distinct personality. Yeah, yeah. They do come up with a character that is kind of gets really excited about blowing things up and starts to try and explode everything as if that's like some great imaginative new character. Is that baby girl? Um, <laughs> he's like the, well, he's, no, he's it's the not, kid of Jamie Kennedy, the little, he's, no. just like, he's like Bam Bam. He's, he's got, he gets, <laughs> he gets into uh, Michael Gross's like weapon stash and he's just blowing shit up. <laughs> no, no, it's an and he adult, shouts, but... he shouts, boom, boom. <laughs> But they they don't even like go. Hey, look, he's like the new bird. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. It's just it, it's played as if they've mm. come up with this crazy new character that no one's ever thought of before. Uh, so basically, yeah, um, it kind of had potential, but they just decided not to come up with an interesting plot. So uh, it's, it's it's a damn shame that they've yeah because they were doing pretty well with the series for a while, but that last film mm. just kind of let it all down. Oof, and yeah. I feel like it it looks like that's going to be what we get in the future. Um, just more of that mm. kind of stuff. It sounds like this is more of that kind of stuff. Yeah. What would you rate it, Alan, mm. out of 10 out of interest? I gave it five. Mm, yeah, mm. about that's about the same as the last one, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was, yeah, just the mm. same. Have Have you guys actually, um, have either of you guys seen the trailer for the pilot for the Kevin Bacon starring sequel TV series to Tremors? Uh, we mentioned in our oh. Tremors episode it was being made. No. Uh, it, it recently got binned. They didn't want to pick it up after the pilot. But... <laughs> what a shocker. But the trailer for the pilot makes it look pretty good. I think it's a real shame. I, I think it looks a hell of a lot more exciting than than Tremors Six certainly sounds. 